The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Welcome to Gate City Chronicles. I'm Kevin Avard, your host. And today I'm joined by Bob Corcus, author of Finding a Fallen Hero. Welcome to the show, Bob. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much. Um, the first thing that caught my eye when I saw this book is a riveting story of what must have been one of the most dangerous and vulnerable jobs in all of war. That was from Ken Burns. He wrote that. He did. In with, with this. That is quite an honor. You know, the, the funny thing about it is, is because his name is at the top, my name's at the bottom. I wonder how many people have bought that book thinking he wrote it, not me. Yeah. Which is okay with me. Sure. Because he's well, more popular than me. Well, after this show, you're going to be extremely hope, popular. Hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, finding a Fallen Hero, uh, the death of a ballet. Uh, a ball turret gunner. Correct. Most people don't have a clue what a ball turret gunner is. What is a ball turret so gunner? So on a, on a B-17 Flying Fortress, which was the plane my uncle was a crew member on in World War II, mm -hmm. um, there, are, there are six gunners on the plane. They each, have, they each cover a position on the plane. And the ball turret gunner is on a little bubble on the bottom of the plane that gives him full 360-degree um, azimuth rotation. His job on the plane is to protect the bottom of that plane from enemy attack. Um, there's top turret gunners, ball the waist gunners, high. tail gunners. My uncle flew the ball turret gunners. So it, it was a position on the plane that was vital to the health of that aircraft to make it to where it was going to for its bomber raid. Now was that one of the more vulnerable areas? It, it, it was in some respects um, because of if there was an issue somehow with the plane, he couldn't get out of the ball turret, um, and the landing gear was bad, he could be crushed. And actually, Andy Rooney, in a, as a reporter for um, Stars of Trump, I'm not sure of that, but Andy Rooney witnessed an event where a ball turret gunner was crushed. They couldn't get him out. So in that respect, it was a position that it, you know, was vulnerable in that sense. But in other senses, it was surrounded by bulletproof um, armament around the ball turret gunner. He was protected versus the waste gunners that's in, in the B-17, which was unpressurized, the, the, in open air. So we're talking minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit when they're at al altitude on their bomb run. The waste gunners, by contrast, um, were standing up and exposed to nothing but the thin metal of the, of the B-17. So they were more vulnerable than a ball turret. But in terms of the ball turret was a tough position to fly because a lot of guys would get vertigo because the ball turret itself, when he's angling his guns down, he can move an azimuth, it's 360 and elevation. So when he goes down and he loses the vis visible point of the bottom of the plane, he, it can be disorienting for the ball turret because he's, he's lost his frame of reference. Mm -hmm. And for many people, it can get hard to do that. And plus, he's, he's using his feet in conjunction with his hands to try to determine wh where he's moving and also where he's going to fire to try to get the enemy pilots. It's a very hard position to fly. You had to be small, too. You had to be, on average, my uncle was five feet six. Uh, that's a, a, a good thing for him to be small to fit in the ball turret. And on his last mission, he was in that ball turret probably seven to eight hours in a fetal position. That's, a, that's amazing. How, how, many, uh, how much training did they have to go through before they were, they were put in that position? Well, my uncle um, initially be, uh, became an aerial gunner at Las Vegas Army Gunnery School, which is now Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. um, 
he did about an eight-week training to become a gunner. He, he had to pass the grade. Some guys dropped out. He, he went in there in December 1943, actually December 42. He was uh, training to be a gunner. And then after that, he went to a specialty school. He learned how to be a flight engineer in the B-17. He did a 16-week school there. And then after that, he went to crew training in Alexandria, Louisiana. where He got to met, meet the other members of his crew, which he later took, went with to England. The 8th Air Force, which, is, which he was a part of, flies, flew from England. And they, they bombed Germany, targets in France. Uh, at, at this point, when he was in full service in, in, in his position, where were we in the war at, at that point? He, he entered combat this in he, ent he arrived at Ridgewell, um, England, which was the home of the 381st Bomb Group. They were part of the 8th Air Force again. Uh, he arrived in November of 1943, and he was killed on February 25th of 1944. Mm. And he uh, was pre-D-Day, in, in essence. At that time in the war, it, the, the, the crews um, had to fly a, a maximum at that time of 25 missions. If they could do that, they were released from the combat requirement, unless they wanted to re-enlist. And some of them did that. Wow. Uh, my uncle, as best as I can tell, I think he had he was shot down and killed on his 16th combat mission. Um, he, um, at the time, the P-51s Mustang and the P-47 was a Lightning. They were as flying escort, um, but um, the, the bomber command wanted the escorts to vacate as the bombers got close to the target because they wanted to draw the Luftwaffe fighters up so that they had a better shot of knocking those planes down in addition to bombing the target. So at the time of the war, it was quite violent, and a lot of uh, fighter attacks took place on these bombing formations in addition to flak. I, was, uh, I did read a little bit where it said that more uh, fighters were, were killed by these guys rather than Aerial dog, gunners, than, yep. than dog fights. Yep. Uh, so, that being said, you know you have 30, 40 planes out there, whatever. I don't know what the what the number was. That's a lot of stress. Uh, so, on the one of the missions, my my uncle flew his crew flew on one of the first 1,000 bomber raids that went into Germany. Think about that. And I think there was about 800 fighter escorts. So, wow. You're talking 1,800 planes going to attack a target. That's amazing. So when, when did you start this venture to write this book? So um, it started not as, not as being a book. It started because my dad, um, my father, who was my uncle Tony, Tony it's Anthony Joseph Corcus, who's the ball turret gunner, who was really the primary focus of my book, right? Uh, my father was his, one of his younger brothers. There was eight uh, family members of my uncle Tony's uh, family. Dad was one of five boys, and those three, three girls. Uh, my dad was the second to youngest uh, brother of my Uncle Tony. After my Uncle Tony, my Uncle Tony was shot down on February 25th of 44. Uh, my dad was, uh, I think, a senior in high school at the time, a junior. Um, he, he and the family were just notified that, that my uncle was, uh, was missing in action. That was how they were notified, through Western Union Telegram. My uncle, um, my, my family, my grandparents, my dad, didn't understand necessarily what had happened. And, and clearly, they're frantically writing to whoever can, they can talk to. They, they actually have, they have, they have the other addresses of the other crew members. So they're, they're asking, trying to figure out what happened. So um, it turned out my uncle, and, and this is what I learned through the research, but, and, and finally the book writing, but my, uncle, my uncle's body was returned from uh, uh, the European actually from France. He was interred in France uh, for a portion of his time. But he didn't come home until 1950. Wow. My, my grandmother was a first generation. She was born in Poland. My, both of my grandparents were. And ironically, when, when she was told to go to Arlington National Cemetery, which is where my uncle's buried, to report there, she just went. Because she's a citizen, and she's broken English. She speaks broken English. So she's there to because at the request of the U.S. government to witness a funeral ceremony for her son who was lost in combat six years ago. I got news for you. Mm. They didn't believe that he was in the casket. They had no knowledge of what happened. 
that persisted all throughout. When I grew up as a young boy, I, I revered my uncle through the respect that my, unc my, my uncles and my aunts had for my grandparents had for him. But there was no closure or understanding what happened. Right. So when I went to Arlington National Cemetery with my father, my father had had a picture that one of the family members had taken of the gravestone at Arlington. And that picture was, my dad had never been to Arlington. He's, he lived in... It's, it's breathtaking. It yeah. really is breathtaking. I've been there. So he, he went to Arlington with me. I, I took him. We went on a, a trip there. And he asked to see the memorial of my Uncle Tony. My dad believed the, the body was not physically there. Right. So he didn't get he just envisioned it was shot down, crew plane gone, kinda mentally you disintegr the planes disintegrated, nothing gone. But we went to Arlington uh, in July of uh, nineteen ninety five. This the research took place over many years, but when right. we went to Arlington, we asked for the memorial stone. Where would we find the memorial stone of Anthony Corcus and that that cued them to go to the memorial section because there are graves at Arlington. Well, there are memorials at Arlington where the, the, the soldier was like, shot down over the sea of whatever, Vietnam, right. somewhere in Vietnam, and they were never recovered. But to honor them, there's a memorial stone. So my uncle, my dad went and we asked for the memorial stone. They said, there's no memorial stone. He's buried here. That's what started me on this journey because my dad, and I say this in the book, my dad said, how... How did his body get here? How did that happen? And so this is part of that story. That's where this started for me. As I'm reading also, there, there are other areas. I, I saw a letter in there from somebody who was uh, in prison in, in, in a concentration camp, apparently. A yeah, uh, prisoner of war camp. Uh, and, okay, prisoner of war camp. And just saying, hey, uh, I'm okay. Um, I'm, in, I'm, I'm a prisoner of war. You don't write to this address. I'll write to you when you... You know when I when I can, and let you know where to write. That's amazing. And, and you you found that letter. So part of what I found. So I started with nothing more than the date of my uncle's death, and the fact that I had three other names. So the other thing is my uncle was buried in a group burial. Okay. He was one of four, uh, and I didn't really understand what that was all about. So I, all I had is these four names, and his uh, date of death. That's all I had. I didn't know anything about him. So I started to dig, and I was told what I needed to get was something called an individual deceased personnel file, which would record the places my uncle's body had been before it arrived at Arlington. And when I got that, I learned about what organization he was part of. I learned he was with the 381st Bomb Group, 532nd Bomb Squadron out of the 8th Air Force. Now I'm starting to get some picture, some, some you know, information. Right. And the story kind of evolved from there as I started to put the pieces together of what happened, ultimately trying to answer my dad how my uncle got to Arlington. That's the, that's the, the primary focus of my research, if you will. Uh, let me did your dad read this? Yes. What did he think? Blown away. I was must be proud of you. And, and yeah, he is. But the other thing about it, too, is um, there was a lot of sensitivity when they remembered my Uncle Tony. It was reverence, but it was also ignorance of what happened to him, and it was just reverence. So after I told, my dad didn't know he was a ball turret gunner. He didn't know anything about the missions because the letters that came back from England on the part of my uncle, my uncle, were not um, saying a lot because they didn't want to get censored. They would have been censored if they'd said what they were experiencing, which would have not, you know, would, there were censors checking what they wrote back, mm -hmm. bearing that if the letters got intercepted, it would give up information. Right. Right? So my dad really knew nothing about my Uncle Tony, other than the fact he was killed in the war. So as I reveal the story to him, he's learning things about his brother and, frankly, what he experienced in the war that he had no clue about. So ironically, he started to feel... Who wrote that letter from the concentration camp? Or the again, camp? It's, it's, it was the letter I think you're referring to is Nick, Nick DeRose, Nick. who was the bombardier of the crew. He was writing from Stalag Luft 1 at Barth, Germany. Now, he survived the crash. So when I, yeah, so what happened is I was first led to believe, once I understand who the crew was, because through this individual deceased personnel file, it actually gave me, and, and something else called a missing air crew report. When, when a B-17 went down in combat, they, they filed a report. And in the report, they showed, they indicated what was the circumstances of the loss of the plane. These planes are expensive. Sure. I think it was about 200 grand a pop back in World War II. 
this plane goes missing in action, there's records and there's next to kin that need to be contacted and all that. So once I got an understanding of who the crew were, the 10 guys, I now knew that the other three guys on that stone were part of his crew. Mm. Um, but at that point, I was told that the whole crew was deceased. Everyone was killed. But I got some help by a very, there was some, a lot of good Samaritans that helped me along the way. I didn't know how to do this research. I'd never done anything like this in my life. Certainly getting culminating to get published and have Ken Burns and Dawson was all. This is all how did that happen? <laughs> well, I'll save on that. So um, basically I found out there, there were actually four survivors from the plane crash. And at that point, this um, was. A real, crew of how many? Ten. Oh, there were ten. Okay. I'm thinking in my head there's only four on there. from. Our... So, a, so a B-17 had a pilot and a co-pilot. They were both officers. Mm -hmm. Had a bombardier and a navigator, both officers in the front of the plane. That's four of the ten. And you had a, then you had, um, you had a radio operator, all turret gunner, left and right waist, tail gunner, and top turret gunner. That's your 10-man crew. I was told they were all killed initially by, by alumnus of the 3D First Bomb Group, the Union Group. Mm -hmm. But he was incorrect. And as I continued to dig, I got wind of this missing air crew, missing air crew report. It's called an MACR, 2933 is this number. And I pulled it from the National Archives, and I, found, and I got a tip as to what was in it first. And that's when I was told there were four survivors from that crew. Now, whether they were still alive in 1997 when I started researching was, not, was unknown. Turns out three of the four were still alive. Did, did you get a chance to meet them? I met two of those three. And the third one, I talked on the phone, exchanged information, that sort of thing. So, um, All right. So what is that like? I mean, you knew my uncle? Well... Um, did, were, were they able to talk a little bit yeah, about him? Yeah, there was. There's a lot of, um, the first guy I met, Nick DeRose, which was funny. I, I called him up. So how are you going to find a guy like, De, like the, th the survivors were Don Henderson, the pilot, Raul Ramos, the top turret, turret gunner, Nick DeRose, the uh, bombardier, and Jack Fournier, the co-pilot. Those were the four men that survived the, the plane crash. Turns out Jack Fournier died in 1979, so he wasn't available. Well, I did hunt down, learn his story as well. Were they, were, any idea where they were from? What part of the country? Um, yeah, uh, uh, Don Henderson was from uh, Red Cloud, Nebraska. Um, Nick DeRose grew up in Hillsdale, Michigan. Uh, Raul Ramos um, was from Alliance, Nebraska. And Jack Fournier was from Cleveland, Ohio. Those are the four that had survived. And where was your uncle from? My uncle grew up in Seekonk, Massachusetts. Yeah, we have one New Englander. Yeah, right. yeah. There we go. And it turns out Bartolo, the, mm. the right waist gunner, he was born in Greenwich, Connecticut. So we had two New Englanders on the crew. Uh, the rest of the crew, one was from Texas and South Carolina. So it's, it's you know, uh, New Americans, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, when I contact, I, so Henderson, DeRose, um, Ramos, I, I had four to choose from. I decided to go for DeRose first because it was a, I thought it was a unique name. Mm -hmm. So I went, and this is early internet, so I used some internet search engines, and I, and I, I had two to choose from with, whose name was DeRose, and I called, I picked the right one. And I called him up, and I, I got his wife answered, and I said, can I talk to Nick DeRose? Was he Nicholas? I, I was formal in the names. Can I speak with Nicholas DeRose? And was he a bombardier in World War II? He comes to the phone. And I said, "Did you were you shot down on February 25th, 1944, on a Flying Fortress mission?" Yes. Was your pilot Don Henderson? You, yes. you must, your heart must have been pounding. Oh yeah, I'm going crazy here. Yeah. You know, I'm going crazy that I'm talking to the guy. Well, well, but this first interview was a little strange because I said, "Did you were you shot down on February 25th? Was your pilot Henderson?" Yes, yes, yes. Did you know my uncle Tony, Tony Corcus? He said, he goes, well, you know, the, the, the enlisted men came in from the back. I came in from the front. He must have been a substitute gunner that day. That's probably why I can't remember. But, but I, I then found Raul Ramos. I found him next. He was a top turret gunner and, frankly, a very good friend of my uncle. He said, no, Nick is wrong. Uh, Tony was part of the crew. He's incorrect. But the other thing was that I learned is that these guys, had, they gave each other nicknames. Okay. Most of them didn't know names. My uncle was named, his nickname was Corky, which is my nickname too, ironically. It's not, it's not, does, not a great leap. Throw a Y on the root and you got it, right? <laughs> so Corky was my uncle's um, mm. nickname. And when I later called Nick, he said, oh, Corky, I'm 
sorry. So Raul Ramos corrected the record. He said, no, he was the regular ball turret gunner. He, he trained with us in the States. And ironically, there was a um, substitute on that mission. It was the tail gunner. That's the first time I think he flew with that crew and he was killed on the mission. And uh, you, you, you talk about, uh, you know, there are other things, you know, I'm just pulling out like 12 o'clock high. The guy up, upstairs is obviously looking at that, right? The, the guy's, uh, uh, the, the guy. The, the top turret gun. The top turret gun. Yeah, yeah. He's, well, they're trying to find relative to the plane, where is these, where are these fighters? Right? So the other, the other thing, this was an extraordinary odyssey for me. Um, I actually, there's two things that I did that I thought, I'm still amazed that I was able to do this. I found, so this missing air crew report referred to another crew obviously writes this because this crew's downed. And by crew position, I'm told in this report that by the ball turret gunner of the other plane, he's the one that does some witnessing to my uncle's down. Later on, I, I find him, this ball turret gunner. His name was Richard Brown. He took photographs of my uncle's plane on the mission it was down from within the ball turret. It's amazing. Are those pictures in here? Yes, amazing pictures. Um, so I, I couldn't believe he was even taking the pictures to begin with because he's, he's you know, they're, they're dealing with combat here. He's not on the joyride. Everything that you're telling me, I'm just trying to think, you know, you know your, your dad is, is, is listening to this and, and he's seeing the pictures. He hasn't had closure for all those years. He goes to Arlington Cemetery to find out, you know, where he's buried or the memorial. Come to find out that's not the, the whole story. And this is a whole journey for him. And you're kind of living it with him together. I wonder how many times he's read this. Not many, but he, 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 I verbally told him the story before I wrote it. Yeah. You no know, closure. I learned something fascinating for me. I, um, there were six men killed on the crew. <clears throat> Three of the six families did not appreciate or, or believe that those three men Knew, you know, the, they weren't there, and, and, you know, but when you lose a loved one, sure. you persist with the belief that it's possible they could come home. Hope right? against hope. Three other of the crewmates' families fully bought, bought and accepted what had happened. I thought that was fascinating. So my uncle Tony's family, my dad and his family, didn't believe that he had died. Now, some of the letters they received, that they, there was no confirmation that my uncle had died. Mm -hmm. They had bailed, the rest of the crewmates had bailed out before he had. So did he survive? They didn't know. That was the case on three of the crew members. There just wasn't definitive information that these guys, these crew members, had in fact died. So the family prefers to accept that they're possibly still alive, as opposed to the other three, where either crew members were visited the family, or they got the definitive information in letters that cauterized that wound, mm -hmm. and they accepted the war death. But ironically, my uncle Tony and my dad's family, the Wanning family, the Navigator's family, as well as the uh, um, Bartolo's family, they didn't accept it. Where this exactly book offered was he closure. shot down over? So the, the raid was to Augsburg, Germany. They, were actually sh they actually dropped the bomb load, and they had some trouble with their aircraft. As a result, they tried to make a run for Switzerland, where they would have been interred for the rest of the war, you know, in the neutral company. Right. I, can't, I think it's in. I'm not sure if it's interned or interred. But anyways, um, basically, they would have been kept by the neutral country, and, and that's what Henderson tried to do. So they actually went down in a small village in Germany, south of Stuttgart, uh, 28 miles or so south of Stuttgart, Germany, in a small village called Villemendingen. That's where this plane crash landed. I visited there, met eyewitnesses. You met gave me pieces of the plane. Oh my gosh. Wow, what a journey. The pilot who shot my uncle's plane down identified him. Talked to his brother. The brother, the, the pilot himself, was killed in the war. What was that conversation all about? It was not a conversation that we did through discussion. It was through letter writing. And I wrote in English. He got someone to he wrote back in German, and I got someone to help translate it for me. So the actual person that shot down the plane, you were communicating with? I'm talking to his brother. Okay. Bert Clemens is the pilot. He was from, uh, he was with the 8th Squadron of the 3rd Fighter Wing of the 3rd uh, Group. It's, it's a German name. I don't even want to try to pronounce it. I, 
it, but anyways, he was the he was identif he identified or took claim for my uncle's B seventeen. And there's a record I actually found the actual record. Yeah, they kept a lot of records, didn't they? But it but a claim was only good if you had a witness. So if you made a claim and you were the only one there, then it was a claim that was un unproven. Um, but Clem Clemens himself later in the war, in 1945, he was killed near the Russian front. His his brother never found his body. Mother never had the body returned, unlike my grandmother, who at least, I don't know if she believed that she witnessed the actual burial of my uncle at Arlington, but my dad, no, and, and frankly, everyone that I contacted, I contacted every family the next to Ken, I talked to them all, they were grateful to hear information about something that they thought was gone. So you, you did a lot of research, obviously. How long did it take you to, to finish this, this whole so I. I started, my dad and I went to Arlington in 1995, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what I was doing for the first couple of years. I was, my dad kept saying, give up, no one cares. I'm like, ah, let me, I don't mind. So I kept letter writing. And then 1997 is the year it exploded for me. That year was just full of research. I had so many research threads, you know, I was, I was the sole researcher in my book. I was mm -hmm. just doing it on my spare time when I wasn't working. Um, but for the most part, uh, it took me time, it took me about five years, well, about five years of full-time research, not to, I, I say seven years, because the first two years I didn't really make a lot of headway. From 95 to 2002, this story was researched and appreciate, you know, understood. And then it took me several years to get published. And then in 2008, o University of Oklahoma Press accepted my, my, my manuscript, and they, they published me. All right, you, we got a minute and a half. Okay, sorry. No, you don't be sorry. This is, I'm, I'm enthralled. Uh, this, this is amazing. Uh, how did Ken Burns find out about this? So the Oklahoma Press said, who would you want to get blurbs from that you think would increase the readership of the book? Ken Burns at the time was putting together a uh, documentary about World War II called The War. I've, I've been watching it. Yep. So I, I contacted him. I, it, it was a multi-threaded attack, if you will, and I, if, he, if he actually watches this. I had many irons in the fire, and, and obviously one of them succeeded. Mm -hmm. And uh, his personal assistant called me. I was actually homesick, and I never expected to even be called to. Uh, he 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 said, "Send the book to me. I will provide a blurb for you." Nice, right? All right, you got thirty seconds. How do people find this book? And I hear it's going to be on audio as well. Yeah, it's this book. It, uh, despite being out in two thousand eight, it is being was brought to an audio, audio book through audible.com. It should be released in September. Mm -hmm. um, the book is available through amazon.com. You can buy it through there. Um, that's, you, if you order it through Barnes & Noble, or things like that, you'll have to pre-order. Okay. But uh, is there a website that you have? I do not. It is a, again, the University of Oklahoma Press is the publisher. Okay. Um, but uh, Amazon is, I got some good reviews in Amazon that people can take a look further at the book. Okay. Well, Bob Corcus. Finding a Fallen Hero. Get this book. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. We appreciate it. You're welcome. If you have a story like this or any story that you would like to share with the folks, come on Gate City Chronicles. I'd love to hear it. Until next week, thanks for watching. Thank you for watching Gate City Chronicles. And we want to thank our sponsor, Aardvark Cleaning. They've been a sponsor for quite a few years now, and uh, we appreciate them being a sponsor. And if you want to be a guest on our show, Contact accessnashua at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your story. Until next week, thanks for watching. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.